Hi, Joe Cerrone. Welcome to Introduction to 3D Printing, CAD 107. Today we're going to go through the second part of Chapter 3, 3D Printer Workflow and Software. As you remember in the last lecture, we talked about 3D Printer Workflow and Software. Workflow consists of design, slice, and print. Essentially, we're using a CAD system. In this example, it's AutoCAD. Slice, we're using the Dremel Digi Slicer. And print, we're using the Dremel 3D printers to print those projects. We're using STL file format from our CAD system to import into our slicing program. And we give an example of how to print the base last week. So picking up where we left off, we're using the Dremel Digi Slicing software. It's almost identical to Cura, and what the textbook does is it says the, 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 the textbook lecture is based off of Cura. So they're very similar. As we look at the software, we're going to talk about things like the printer, material, and the quality, and these other settings like shells, infill, material. We're not going to talk so much about speed and travel or cooling, but we will talk about support, build plate, adhesion. And last week we talked about special modes with spiralized outer contour. So the one thing that we can do is to simulate our print and to see how it's going to look before we print the part. And to do that, what we would do is would be to open the part in the Dremel software. And so let's review the steps to do that. We'd start off in AutoCAD. And here's an example of our memo pad holder. We modeled it with AutoCAD, and now we're ready to 3D print it. So before we can 3D print it, what we're going to do is we're going to export that file as an STL. And we're going to export it with your initials and then the project or the lab number. We'll save it. Click on the part. And then we'll open that part in the slicer. And so switching over to the slicer, I was hoping that was the slicer. That's my capture program. So we're starting up our, our Dremel slicing software and you can see, we can see the build area and this is our palette. And then we have our commands located up here at the top in pull down menus. We can configure our 3D printer over here. And we're going to go and say that we're gonna use a material, a Dremel material of PLA. And then we're going to import the CAD file by saying open file. And then we're going to select our STL file and bring that file in. Now, as you're using the Digi Slicer, if you turn the wheel on the mouse, it will zoom in and out. You push the left wheel while it's on the part, it will move the part provided it's in the move command. If it's not highlighting the part itself and you hit the left mouse button, it doesn't do anything. If you hit the right, right mouse button, it will orbit. So the first thing we notice on this is the orientation. And this orientation, and we'll talk about it in the textbook, isn't really the best because it's 
it's going to require support material which will take more time. So let's look at how that works. If we just take it right out of the box and we say let's go with low quality 0.3 millimeters. And the reason I start off with low quality is because it's faster and the layer height is larger and that's the reason that it's faster. Smaller layer heights are finer, you have smoother parts. So by orientating this part in this direction, we will need support material. And so when we look at support, I have it checked off, which means it will generate that. We won't see anything until we prepare it. So we bring the file in, then we set the material and the quality, and then we hit prepare. And what it'll do is it'll give us an estimate of how long it will take to print that project. And so it's estimating two hours even. And then we can go over to this view mode and we can look at the layers and we can see how the object is going to be built. And this area right here is what's known as infill or support material. It's not infill, actually it's support material. Infill will be what's inside of the outer shell. As we look at how this works, we can pull down and go through our build one layer at a time. And so we can see here's our infill pattern and this blue area is our support material. And then as we bring this up, we can see how it adds this support material because the 3D printer can print over some open spaces. It's called bridging, but it can only do it can only print over an open area at a certain amount before it starts to sag. And we'll talk about that later in the chapter. So this part is shown orientated in this direction and it requires infill and it will take two hours. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reorientate it by rotating it 90 degrees. And then I'm going to hit prepare again. And so now we've cut that down to one hour and 35 minutes to print. And so by eliminating all that support material in the middle of it, we save about 25 minutes, which is significant when you're printing a lot of different parts. So as we're looking at simulating our print, one of the things we want to do is to look at what the best orientation is. And so we talked about a little bit of view modes with these different layer heights. Remember that you need to prepare it before you're able to then see it. And anytime you make a change to it, you have to hit the prepare button again. Print quality and layer height. So as we look at low quality versus high quality, the difference is in the layer height. And so higher quality has smaller layer heights. Shells, as we look at shells in the STL, we're looking at how it's actually gonna build the outer surface of the part. And so depending on the strength that you want, you can tweak the outer shells of the part so that they're thicker. Platform adhesion talks about how we hold the part to the palette. And so when we work with these different platform adhesions, for example, if we were to look at a brim, a brim would hold the part to the palette. And what it does is it gives it more contact because what happens is sometimes when you print a large object, as it starts to cool, the edges will start to peel up and you will get some problems with that. So one solution is to add a brim to it, which will give it more surface area to hold down to the palette. Skirts essentially do the same thing. Um, well, not exactly the same thing as I, as I talk about it. Um, when you're creating a part with a skirt, what it does is it gives it the ability to purge out some of the material as it's printing. And so it talks a little bit about some of these tips um, in printing a skirt. When we look at rafts, 
what we're looking at is a way to adhere that even more or, or to hold it down. We were using rafts when we were printing uh, these large flat clock faces because we were having problems with the part peeling off of the print bed and as it would cool we would get a warped part and by using these different plate adhesions you can experiment with the best way to print the part so that you get the best surface adhesion. Support material, this is a good example of what we just talked about. By enabling support material you can see that this blue area will print and then we remove that blue area or we remove that support material and then we have our part beneath it. It comes off relatively easy. Very often I'll use um, uh, just a, a um, I, I, I often use a uh, small pliers or a, um, uh, a tin snip or something like a cuticle. I, I often, to tell you the truth, I, I often use um, manicure tools, something for like a, a clipper for doing cuticles because it's very fine and allows me to get in there and, and clip off the material that I don't want. And so support material is generated and needs to be generated when you have these open areas and you can save a lot of time by orientating the, the part in a, in a way that requires less support material. And so you can see the difference between the part orientated vertically and, and horizontally. And we saved about 25 minutes by doing that. And you can so think about support. They talk about it as the mortar between, between the, the bricks and things like that. And so here's our orientation as we talked about that just recently. And then some other things that the author talks about is sometimes they want to cut these parts or or work with ways to print. Maybe you have a large print that won't fit on the part. 3D Builder is an excellent tool to slice your parts. And so if you uh, have a Windows 10 PC, it should have Windows uh, 3D Builder on it. And 3D Builder will open your STL file. You can cut one half out, keep the bottom, cut it again, keep the top, print them in two separate pieces. It's very fast and very efficient. And I think Microsoft is actually betting on 3D printing becoming very mainstream because they're putting it in to their Windows interface. Bridging, when we talk about bridging, bridging is the ability for a 3D printer to print over in open space without support material. So this is a good video if we take a look at it. Be honest, do you really want... So I turned off the sound on this and I can just kind of talk over it. And this person put some upgrades on their 3D printer with cooling so that they can get better bridging results. And so here's an example of the 3D printer building the first layer. And then as it builds the part up, we can see an example of bridging. And so bridging is the ability for it to go long distances without support material. Infill allows us to create different patterns inside of the part. And so when I first started working with 3D printers, I thought that infill was, I thought that the 3D printed parts were solid. But they're not. They're set up with infill, which prints much faster and provides support. And so the way that you have the ability to alter the infill can affect the print. We've done some nice work with printing small squares for a chessboard, for example, that was backlit. And by having different infill patterns, when you would shine light underneath it, you get kind of a neat effect. And so you can have these different infill patterns and infill densities that are visual in nature, kind of aesthetic. And you can have other things like 
more dense infill patterns for stronger parts. And that's another area that we can tweak in the slicer. Retraction and stringing, this is just an example of what can happen when the part is not perfectly orientated within the slicer. This is an area we'll come back to when we start looking at uh, problems with 3D printing. Most of those we don't have because the Dremel printers use RFID chips to set the settings within the slicer based on the material choice. And that's true of the temperature settings as well. We want to take a look at it as we're working with it, but typically on these uh, printers, they set everything for us, which is great because we get very good quality prints without having to have a high level of knowledge of our different materials and temperatures, as well as speed and cooling multipliers. You can tweak these and, and work with them, but at a fundamental level, at an introductory level right now, we just want to be familiar with the slicing and that we have the ability to tweak these speeds and cooling multipliers. You can print more than one object at a time. So I could take that part and have two or three of them printed up at a time. We do that very often. Once we have the first product prototype made, we can then set those up to be the maximum number on each pallet. Maybe we want to print three at a time. It'll take six hours, and so we can set that up over a number of 3D printers. Extruding in multiple extruders. If we look at different extruders, I like this video. On YouTube, this is the show about 3D printing and DIY electronics. So that's a good example. You can take a look at some other things, some ideas for you for Halloween if you like, um, as we take a look at some of these other aspects of 3D printing. We do have the ability to um, 3D print using multiple extruders using our Ultimaker printers at the college. G-code is the code that is created when you save your file to the USB. So once I have my parts sliced and I'm happy with how the orientation and the print looks, what I can do is I can then prepare that for printing. And what that does is it creates these G-code files. And G-codes are a very old programming language designed to control machine tools. It has its origins in basically CNC machining. And so if we look at the G-codes from our file, we can see that it has these G codes, which are kind of different setup codes. These areas right here are, um, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I, um, I better, rather than say what the semicolon areas are, um, M codes are miscellaneous codes. G28 would be a homing code. And a G1 code would be a linear interpolation move, which would move it in the Z axis, filling 50 millimeters at a feed rate of 400, um, I would say, millimeters per second. And then as we go through these different G-codes, 
I know my G codes because I used to program CNC machines and I still do. And so you can linear program these machines and then you can read how these codes work. And then once you get a good feel for it, you can add some miscellaneous codes like to purge the material or to swap out the filament. There's a number of tips and tricks as you get more experience with it. But essentially, if we wanted to go through and print this, what we would do would be to, we'd slice it here, and then we would save it to the removable drive. And so when I save it to the removable drive, then it's gonna have this file name D32 with this project. I'm not gonna eject it because I wanna take a look at that file. And so if I look at that file, here's my G code file. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open that with a text editor. And so we'll open that with Notepad and so you can see that's the codes that are going to control the placement of the material, or at least to, to generate the toolpath. Okay. So that completes our lecture on chapter three. Uh, be sure to complete the review questions at the end of the chapter and turn in the projects into the assignments folder. So if we take a look at our homepage, you're going to want to go to the assignments tab and you're going to want to place those in the lab area and then you'll take a look at the quizzes area and you'll complete the review questions at the end of each chapter. Okay, we'll see you online.